All right. Um, so I have a feeling a lot of people will be watching this recording later, especially if you're in honors and trying to gather your information on um, how you wanted to want to respond uh, to the post for the week. Um, but we're diving into a kind of a new topic, looking at this whole, um, I guess, the next eight artist works um, is going to be looking at artists who are essentially rebelling by commenting on the past. And so my question is, what are some things that artists do to create commentary on the past? So whether or not they love or hate the past, what can we think of what an artist might do to show their opinion? Ooh, that's great. And a work that idealizes or criticizes a style, technique, or piece. And what's something that's interesting is a lot of our vision of the past is created by artists who actually came a little bit later and were reflecting on that past. And I'll show you what I mean by this piece today. So this piece might look familiar to you. I believe I've given you the tools. Can you, um, the first line is going to the ceiling, these sort of honeycomb ceilings. I want you to know what's happening to the ceilings as they are traveling back. And the second line right here is who are these figures all assembling together? So Elizabeth, you can choose one thing and I'll do the other. Remember, this is not a what's right or wrong part of the section. We're just coming up with what we think is happening. Ancient philosophers, excellent. So you are very aware of this piece, I can tell already. Um, and then what we're seeing up here is something that was around in ancient Greece, kind of, um, but it was really forgotten about during the Middle Ages, purposely forgotten about, and um, came back again in a huge way in the uh, Renaissance period, which is linear perspective. And what linear perspective is, for those who don't know and who are watching this recording, is simply a mathematical tool to create something that, so that it looks like it's going off into space realistically. So this is when we really start to have a, an intense level of realism in our background in art. And the artists are very proud of it. They're showing off all of these in all their different pieces. Um, and you'll, if you continue to look into Renaissance work, you'll see it everywhere. Okay. So I know that I can tell you already know some stuff about this piece, Elizabeth, based on the information you gave. Is there anything that you wonder about this piece? What point to one thing that might make you question what's happening here? You can also use your board tool too and circle or write on the board as well.
ooh, it's interesting how some people are in groups talking while others are just hanging out there on their own. That is a great observation. Um, there's several things happening here. It's a, you can tell that this whole scene, even the um, whimsical parts that are happening here are still devised, right? So this guy is moving to bring your eye over to this guy. His arm is coming down. They're all connected, looking backward and forward, but slowly the line is coming down to meet these two figures, which are definitely central, and then the line continues to go down and stable. But you point out that some people are secluded and some people are very social. And that is actually a commentary on the philosophers themselves. So each person here, uh, they're trying to show the personality of the individual philosophers. And in this painting, they have philosophers from all different cultures as well. So there are some um, Arabic philosophers it combined with some Greek, lots of Greek philosophers, and then Roman philosophers as well, um, and even a few Christian philosophers in this piece. So that's a great observation. And so some philosophers, as you might imagine, are just very unto themselves and brooding and dark thinkers, whereas others really get gain knowledge through conversation. Okay, so this is the famous painting called The School of Athens by Raphael. And this was a difficult task for me to do. I had to synthesize the great movement that is the Renaissance down to one work. And as you guys might know from studying um, a little bit of art and history classes, that's a lot to do to choose one work that represents all of the Renaissance, right? And this catches people by surprise. Because Raphael, he was a really big deal back in the day, but you don't hear a whole lot about him now. We tend to focus on Michelangelo or Leonardo more. But Raphael is actually what we would call a highlighter out here. Circle him around here. We would call the academic artist. So he would he was a passionate reader and researcher. He was a devout follower of humanism as well. So he was definitely representative of the educated class. Um, Leonardo was, um, as we all know, was uh, very much a scientist as well, but he was um, kind of very singular for his time. Raphael did a good job at blending in with the rest of the crowd. So he's a good representation of, of what everyone else was interested in in the Renaissance. Michelangelo was a man unto himself. <laughs> um, so the School of Athens here, this piece, um, is actually walking a fine line in the culture at this time. So we are looking at um, this is painted in the High Renaissance. And what's interesting is when I show this to students for the first time as we've come out of like the Middle Ages and looking at all other kinds of work, people are surprised that the clothes that they're wearing are not in fact Renaissance attire. I'm going to move one slide forward to show you, compare and contrast. So the fashion that's seen in, <laughs> yeah, the fashion that's seen in uh, this piece, School of Athens, is super flowy robes, right? No pants, really. Whereas the image to the right here is what the artists like Raphael would have been wearing. This is what people wanted to wear. That was high fashion. So no more flowiness down across the ankles. It's all high up above the knee now. And we're showing off that calf. <laughs> Lots of hats as well. So um, even to the Renaissance era, that the time they were in, this image was supposed to look ancient. Um, <clears throat> so looking at this piece here, we, Raphael is showing off his knowledge of math and linear perspective in the background. Um, all of these subjects here, as you said earlier, are um, famous philosophers. And where do you think a piece like this belongs? What kind of room do you think this uh, mural belongs in? A room that highly prizes old education. A study? Exactly, or a library. 
and a library, uh, yeah, a library, this is a personal library, so it's kind of like in between that um, study or, or library. And um, still at this time in history, most libraries were personal. Um, you can actually see in the bottom left over here, the cutout of a door right here. So believe it or not, uh, this was after the work was painted, like a century after it was painted, some new owner of the estate came in and said, there needs to be a new door in this library. So they cut a door right in the painting, which is a bummer. <laughs> um, but that's happened several times in art history as well. Um, so there's lots of little things going on in here, a whole bunch of symbolism. But I want you, the, you to pick out two of our contemporaries. So the images that we have of the philosophers, there were no pictures left behind of these philosophers. Um, there are some sculptures, but even those might not be real. Um, so the artist instead, Raphael, chose to use people that he knew to model as these philosophers. So I'm going to give you the board tools. Can you circle two or one character in here, and I'll circle the other, that is definitely a famous artist of this time? Raphael was kind of the bridge between all the worlds. He was friends with artists that normally aren't friends with each other. Yes, guess who that is? Leonardo, right. I'm going to circle this guy right here. Any guesses as to who this brooding man is? Catches people by surprise. Glad to get to know the personalities of the artist. They're not that surprising. It's actually Michelangelo. So Michelangelo, uh, if you look up any of his histories or biographies, yeah, yeah, he's a super brooding person, very angry with everyone in the world. Um, he's also kind of always considers himself as a sacrifice for his art. And you see that in some other pieces. So this is another reason why I took Batman. Right, he's such a Batman, exactly. <laughs> he is inventing and crazy cool things all the time in his Batcave and doesn't want anyone to know about it. <laughs> but yet he kind of does. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, so a lot of people like to still reference this piece sort of as the symbol of the Renaissance because you have a huge rise in humanism, so all, most of these philosophers here, as I said, are not Christian. There's only a few in here that are. So at this point in history, in the 1500s, um, Europe is still controlled by the Catholic state. So what risks are they driving here, uh, painting images of people from the past? Non-Christian peoples. Exactly. So that's the perspective of the humanist, is that that valuable knowledge comes from all places. But at this point in history, did the Catholic Church agree with the humanist? Okay, I found this on the Sorry. website. Sorry, Siri decided to answer that question. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. So humanists had to hide it. Um, they had to not 
they, while they did believe that all value in knowledge uh, comes from all places, they had to hide their work in sort of secretive properties um, and also say everything was an allegory for a Christian message. So um, that's to say, and you can even do this now for sure, um, that say you want to read a Satanist work. You could say I'm looking for the Christian allegory in this Satanist writing, right? Um, and it, in part, it could be true, but in the other part, you know, you could be pushing against your own beliefs and religions as well. Um, but that was a common scapegoat to get out of uh, possible punishment, was to say, I'm looking at these great philosophers' works for the Christian message. Um, and that's how most artists were defending it. But this only lasted for so long. They had a pretty lax pope at the time, but soon enough, in the next pope's reign, um, they had a, uh, a reckoning, essentially. Um, Savonarola, uh, a famous politician, was appointed to power, and he had a lot of Renaissance works burned because he said they were of um, pagan worship, uh, basically because they were not totally uh, Christian. This is something that seems insane to us now because of our culture, our, our country's founding principles. But remember, this is 1500 right now, so really the concept of the U.S. and the territories are just getting started. And a lot of the backlash that you're seeing start to happen in Europe at this time is what you know, people are trying to escape to come to the U.S. So it's interesting to see um, the difference in viewpoints. Okay. So I only went through a little bit of symbolism there, the big stuff. If you want to click on the link right here, it is 2 minutes 59 seconds, but you don't have to watch the whole thing. <laughs> um, this is a man pointing out some different symbols that you see in the piece. Um, whenever you're ready, if you can write down one symbol that might have surprised you.
Ooh, yes. Great observation. Yeah, and that even carries over to today as well. On the mall in D.C., um, the architecture that you see is in fact Roman in inspiration, and uh, more so than Greek. I would say some of the uh, Thomas Jefferson really appreciated um, the Greek sculpture, but for the most part, a lot of our architects have followed the Roman ideal. Cool. All right, so the question for honors in terms of social, social reaction. Why do you think an artist would risk a death or imprisonment to send a message? And so this is going to spark our conversation today. I'm going to post this as a new thread to the first one. Okay, cool. And it's just a screenshot of this image. And I might make a link of the recording in here later on, too. Um, and, you know, really, if you think, if, if you can come up with any examples from your own head of why you think what is worth an artist um, dying or being imprisoned in order to get their message out, there's some things that might not seem like they're worth it, but what do you think is worth it? Okay, so there's this contemporary artist here named Bill Voila, <laughs> or Viola, but um, he is in fact Roman, or I mean Italian, I should say, but he has returned to uh, Florence a while ago to make this exhibition. Now, this is one of the leading um, contemporary artists in video art. So he uses film and such to create art pieces and installations. A quote from his um, show is, he calls it a homecoming. Bill Voila, the acclaimed contemporary artist, is back in Florence, the cradle of the Renaissance masters, who inspired some of the most famous works, powerful, immersive, in video installations dealing with extremes of human emotion and experience. And what you can see here, in this piece um, is that you see two women with pretty contemporary hair um, and such who are wearing some flowier outfits but not costumes of the era. And then all around them are these different um, really basic scenes. It's just like a painting in the background. And what Bill Walla did is he made these high resolution videos that are going a super slow motion, where you see the, one, the women having a conversation. You don't actually hear anything, though. It's pretty silent. But in this uh, exhibit, his work is projected on blank walls across from famous Renaissance pieces. So <laughs> it seems pretty obvious here. Um, but what comment do you think he's making on the past. This is just a still from the image, but the image is just slow moving women like uh, in a conversation. Yeah, Elizabeth, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, there is a certain amount of egotism in this piece as well. This is the artist right here standing right before it. Um, that was captured in this uh, YouTube video. But he is one, definitely saying that he has reached the height. He is as good as the masters from the Renaissance. And how do you think some of the rest of the art world feels about that? Kind of put yourself in their shoes.
is definitely from jealousy. Yeah, yeah. So he is definitely saying here that he is a master at his craft just as the famous Florence artists are masters at theirs. Um, and his being video art. And really, the Florence level artists don't, you know, they're long dead. They can't say anything against it. And clearly, his acclaim and fame has allowed the museum to create this exhibit because they figured a lot of people would come to see it. And um, it's a pretty huge deal and a big claim. And he is also, in many ways, trying to reinvent what he thought a modern day Renaissance composition and image and style would look like. But that also is, um, it doesn't have the same depth or detail as the paintings of the past, for sure. So good. So this is, you know, we're, as we look into contemporary artists, um, we really start to see some jealousy in the art world. And there are some feuds out there. There's uh, quite a lot of um, uh, discourse back and forth between artists um, that are uh, you know, like your Twitter Twitter arguments today between celebrities. Okay, so you can choose one side. I'll choose the other. I put the little image down here just as a reference um, in case you forgot it. Um, we're just describing in short words style and process. You take one, I take the other, and we're going to give some short notes to remember this work by. You're right. So it is painted straight onto the plaster, so you know this went really quick. Um, something interesting is that oil painting is really starting to develop at this time in Northern Europe, so Germany and um, Denmark and uh, such, uh, such places. That's becoming the big thing. And they try to do oil painting in Southern Europe, but the temperatures are really finicky. So most artists continue to do the traditional method of fresco or plaster painting. And that contrast from um, Northern Europe where if they try to do the plaster painting, it just doesn't dry at the right rate. So it's interesting, those two different processes just came about because of climate. Okay, so to compare and contrast, there is lots to contrast. You choose one side, I choose the other. Yeah, I would say symbolism and honoring history. This would be Italian, though. Yeah. 
what's crazy at this time too is that nations are really just starting to kind of form on the modern level that we know today. So what it means to be Italian has changed over time. Um, but it's really starting to become a concept at this point in history. Just a little bit. Okay, so this is a big one. <laughs> How do works like um, The School of Athens by Raphael affect the art world? Let's start at the bottom. Mm, yes. It's interesting too because um, you can tell that the because Rome was really proud of their Greek being a culture that they took over and being a part of their heritage. Um, but for later, Italy is proud of Rome and is also proud of Greece by proxy. Um, and we can really see the symbolism that that Roman Greek Greco-Roman heritage is a, still a huge symbol of pride today. Yes. Yeah, either they have to sneak around and hide it. Okay. I'll go to the next slide. Last one. So how does learning about this piece and the maybe any of the pieces today impact you in your own work? Yeah, inspires you to not be afraid to share what you believe and think despite what others say about it. Excellent. What I really like about this piece is, and I hear this from students all the time, and I don't really think it's true. It's like a cultural block that we have. I hear like, I'm not good at math, I'm an artist. I'm not good at writing, I'm an artist. And in fact, some of our greatest artists have found ways to overcome those academic blocks. Um, that in fact some of the greatest artists are in fact um, often very good writers and often have figured out how to do math. And it's not to say, um, I think it's to recognize that there is like nothing wrong with that. But and also I just think that when people say I'm an artist, they sometimes give up on their other parts themselves. Yeah, math stories and writing into it, right? It's a translation, if anything. Um, and also just to remind ourselves that uh, if there is a block out there with math or with writing, perhaps you can use art to help overcome it. Um, I, when I started my art history classes in my senior year of high school, um, I hated architecture so much. I did not like architecture at all. And I had to basically flip the script because, you know, half of art history is architecture. <laughs> I had to flip the script and convince myself that I liked it and by pointing out some things I liked about it. So I started to look for small parts of architecture that really impressed me. And that's what I would obsess about. In the same way, I think we just need to flip the script every once in a while. If we feel like, oh, I'm, I'm not good at math, it might just have been like one teacher didn't explain something in a way that made sense to you and you know rather than use your artistic skills to work through it you know you instead just uh, we just say I'm not good at it um, and it's like a reminder out there that um, that's uh, doesn't have to be true <laughs> our greatest minds out there are good at art and all the other things as well and we all have it within us to be balanced 
Okay, I'm going to turn off the recording. Um, for those who are watching this, um, please go back to that honors slide if you're looking for the question. On, and it's also posted now in our forum. And I'm going to try to send the recording out to everyone as a courtesy for this first week until we get used to the flow of it. All right, thanks so much for joining me, Elizabeth.